Hello and welcome to the Squeaky Bum Time Podcast presented exclusively on the Chop Sports channel of the Premier Streaming Network. We are recording this for the second time on Monday, May 29th, 9th, 9th. I am your host, Laurent Cortines. In this episode, the Premier League season ends. We know who's going to be relegated and we know who's going to be in Europe. And we're going to go through all of it. But first, thank you, everybody, for <laughs> being a part of this show and listening. And it wouldn't be worth it without the dozens and hundreds of you who listen to the show. So thank you so much for going on this journey. 38 weeks, a World Cup, European Cups, UEFA Champions League, championship games. We've talked through all of it. We talked about a Scudetto for Angela. We've talked about Liverpool falling apart. We've made fun of... Manchester United, we've lamented City's slow season, we've lauded Arsenal, we've declared them chokers, we've declared them winners, we've put five teams down and five teams up, we thought Bournemouth would go, we thought Nottingham Forest would go, we thought all these things would happen, but in the end, after 38 match weeks, we finally have it all, and we have it all from you. Uh, I do it for everybody who listens to the show, I do it for Dave Sturcho, and the whole gang over at uh, the Chop Sports channels and our time over on the Premier Streaming Network. So it's amazing to do a whole season again with everyone, and hopefully we enjoy it. Okay, so let us get to it. Everton, survive. Um, They had the right game. They had everything in hand. They were at home versus Bournemouth. Leicester were at home versus West Ham and Leeds were at home versus Tottenham. Leeds needed the most things to happen. They needed both Leicester and Everton to lose and they needed to win. Leicester needed Everton to lose and they needed to win and Everton just needed to win. And it looked like Everton was in trouble. Uh, Leicester did get the first goal. Of, sorry, um, Leeds gave up the first goal of the day and the second goal of the day, and they were really down from the beginning. Harry Kane getting 30 goals. <laughs> Leeds is always the perfect antidote for any team needing to score goals. And Leicester getting their goals and getting their win versus West Ham, uh, first from Barnes and Madison, just linking up and doing the thing they've been doing all season. But it was Everton. It was Everton with the fight. It was Everton with the effort. It was Everton who rode their crowd and Goodison Park in the face of just a life or death situation for that club. The Corey on the free kick by McNeil after Mina was fouled in the box. I mean, outside the box. It comes off a reflected shot. And the Corey just leathers it as hard as you can hit it, as pure as you can hit it and gets the goal that Everton needs. It's on 57. They really don't look like they're ever going to score. Damari Gray has a header in front of goal before that. There's just opportunities. Garner takes an amazing shot that hits that just tips over. Uh, He was probably the best player on the day, the wing back for them. We saw Connor Cody come in. I was wondering where he was all season. Uh, I didn't understand why Dyche wouldn't play him. But Mina, Tarkovsky, Cody... Um, just a strong back four. We saw Onana, we saw Iwobi, we saw Decore, that group, along with McNeil and Damari Gray. They just did what they needed to do and fought and gave effort. And it was all Goodison Park ever wanted. It was all they needed. And they can breathe a sigh of relief that they remain and retain their Premier League status. There was a little bit of a rushing of the field at the end there was a little bit of a of a sack the board, which is what we really should talk about more than anything. We'll start with Everton, what this means for them. This means their survival. Uh, I know it, it's not literal survival, but it's Everton were a club that were a poster boy for mismanagement, a disconnected board with Mashiri and Bill Kenwright. And I can't remember, Osmanov, I believe is an investor. Osmanov gets pulled out because of the Putin connections. So that's one group of money. They've been spending money like crazy. They've been disjointed about what they wanted to do. 
They went to Ancelotti. They went to Kuman. They went here. They spent for this manager. Then they had Sam Allardyce. They went for, for that manager, Roberto Martinez, all these different ownership groups that are pulling the club from side to side. One manager's players, another manager's players, Gilfi Sigurdsson raping teenagers, that guy just disappearing. Um, it's just one of these clubs that just didn't really have a rhyme or reason. They thought they could spend their way up and they had this plan and they're going to have their stadium. But in the middle of that, they forgot the most important thing is the consistency of manager consistency from top to middle to bottom to academy. So from the boardroom to the directors of football, to the coach. You had the Benitez era before Lampard. He was disconnected from the fans. He he committed a palace coup, removing that middle layer so that he could talk directly to the board. And then they sacked him after he sold their best fullback in Dina, who is an attacking player. So it was always all over the place. You had Ancelotti in between that. How, how was he even there? And then you end up with James Ramirez in the team. So all these things add together. And it was just a chaotic mix that Lampard rode his luck, got the fans on side. There was enough talent with Calvert-Lewin and Decore to get them through. And then Deich, they fired him with just enough time. And I mean just enough time. And they got by with the skin of their teeth. Connor Cody put it best. He was like, it's relief and all singing from the same hymn book. This cannot happen again. This club has got to get itself back together. Everton have not been relegated since 1951. They've only spent three or four seasons out of the top flight. In the 80s, they were on par with Liverpool sharing championships. The, the club of English football was in Liverpool. It was not in Manchester. It was not in London. It was on the docks of the Mersey in Liverpool through the 80s. That's how big a club Everton are. And if they had gone down, they could have disappeared. They were as misrun as someone like Sunderland. I think Sunderland is a good example of a big club, a local club with good history that if they went down, it would be the end. Uh, they might not. It's a bear pit in the championship. You're not guaranteed to come back up. You can go. It happens. It happens. Leeds spent 16 years in the wilderness. Nottingham Forest spent 26 years in the wilderness of the championship up and down. Once you go down, I don't want to know what's going on underneath there. <laughs> and so Everton pulled himself out of it. And they have a chance to go again and set it right. But they've got to do it. They've got to clear people out of the board, get alignment top to bottom, and let Deich do his job. Maybe a season of Deich before you start thinking about attacking football again. Deich is about as David Moyes in a younger mold as you can get where it's a safe pair of hands. You're not going down, even though Burnley did. It was an anomaly. They shouldn't have gone down. Um, they spent seven years in the league. And I would say that the players at Everton are far, far better than anything that Dyche ever had at Everton, even though some of them are from uh, Everton. Heroes, Tarkovsky, Mina, Pickford, the aforementioned Garner, and Decore, just up and down, never say die, never gave up. What an incredible heart performance. It wasn't good football. Whatever it was, it was a gut check performance for them. And I'm happy they're there. The other side of the coin, the sad side, the side we don't want to talk about when Americans fall in love with promotion and relegation is the mighty Leicester City, go down. Seven years ago, this team shocked the entire football world and won the league 5,000 to one, famously behind Robert Huth, Wes Morgan, and Peter Schmeichel in defense with Drinkwater and Conte backing them up, supporting, giving a platform in defense, supporting Mares and Vardy, who scored nearly all the goals. And Leicester City go from winning that championship 
having a couple of down seasons as they try and consolidate and figure out the team, living through the tragedy of their owner, Vishai, dying in the helicopter crash. The Rodgers having two seasons where they were in the top four the whole season, only to finish in fifth place two seasons in a row. Last season's disappointment of finishing eighth coupled with their FA Cup victory that they can take home forever. Leicester, relegated. Leicester, relegated. It just even feels crazy to say it, that this team that was so good has now been sent down and disappears through the moon door of the league. It seems to me that the team never really believed they were going to go down. And so they never played like they were going to go down and never thought they would go down. But the signs were there of a team in trouble. The first weakness was the goalkeeper. Danny Ward was never a replacement for Schmeichel. Um, and he gave the creakiness, although the season before they had been very creaky on set pieces when they finished eighth, disappointingly, they really took another step back. Vardy's goals, which we assumed would dry up, really dried up. They lost about 10 goals from him, 12 goals. And you can see it in their goal number. You know, they they gave they scored 10 less goals, and that's literally Jamie Vardy. Uh, none of the players they signed picked up the slack. Um, Daka didn't end up being that goal scorer. Harvey Barnes did a good job, but they could have gotten Vardy with Harvey Barnes at the same time. Madison and Barnes were great all season. Tielemans, not so much. And this team just sort of drifted into the relegation zone and never really understood what it meant to get out of it. All the experience and know-how of being in a relegation battle from this team's DNA that actually won them the league was gone. There was no Morgan. There was no Huth. There was no institutional memory of relegation battle, uh, which this team had. It, it, It had come up and brought itself up and finished in 14th that first season, uh, then wins the league on a 40 point jump, uh, the year, the next year, the year after under, uh, Ranieri. And so institutionally, they didn't quite understand what was happening to them. They bring in Dean Smith late and nothing really changes. They don't find the win they need. They did get nine wins. This Leicester team, as I said, I was certain that nine wins would be the number that took them up, but they could never get there. They could never find the right, um, the right mixes to get this team in the right frame of mind to say, yes, we're in a relegation battle. It started from the start of the season where they shipped goals, uh, five to Brighton, then six to Tottenham. I mean, they were just giving up goals like crazy early in the season uh, with 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 Danny Ward, where we were like, oh my God, they're going to die. Then they right the ship in between the October and the World Cup. They get into decent shape, but then come back from the World Cup and they're right back to shipping goals, uh, even though they do have a little stretch there with a winning against Villa and Tottenham. But then they go in a tailspin again. That's when Rodgers loses his job and it seems like there's no way out. Dean Smith comes in a little bit too late Uh, The draw against Newcastle was heroic, but lucky. And they set up this opportunity to just be able to have a shot. Uh, I think it left for them in the 2-2 draw against Everton. They win that one. There's a penalty to Madison that he misses. The 5-3 against Fulham was just another sort of disaster class. And then 1-1 against Leeds. You've got to beat the people around you. And they just uh, aren't able to do that. There's also a 1-0 Lost. There's two one nil losses, one against uh, Southampton and one against Bournemouth that are just unacceptable. <laughs> Southampton, excuse me, one, and one against Bournemouth that is just unacceptable. And so Leicester says goodbye to the Premier League. And it's sad because um, these are big clubs and the championship is going to be a real bear put. And we'll get to that when we get to the champions portion of the season. For Leeds, they needed a lot to go right. And they never even showed up to even fight for this relegation battle. If you'd sense a common theme, 
This team was also disjointed at the board level, going from Bielsa to Marsh to Gracia, not really having a cohesive plan where they allow Marsh to handle and buy players during the January window when really this team, and it, but philosophically, they needed to, to shore up and get defensive. And they never really changed out their um, their defensive back line. It was still the same championship level defense they'd had. They were still relying on Luke Ailing and players who'd brought them up. They were so terrible. Uh, they finally cut bait on Melier, who had been terrible all season. I had been talking about how poor they were in the goalkeeping department um, all season. And, you know, if I look at their defensive unit, it's Liam Cooper. You know, it's still ailing. They're playing new guys. Weber, Pascal Struck just shows up ailing. They're moving defenders into the midfield to try and get different levels of solidity. Robin Kalk is in the midfield. So, for sure, they're just playing as many defensive-minded players as possible, and they just were never defensive. All you have to do is look at the bench. Furpo, Aronson, Roca, Somerville, Ruder, Nyonto. That's what they thought they were going to win with, and they just – and that was Marsh's design. And they just couldn't get it done with him. We can play false narratives or, you know, the, what the narrative fallacies. If if Marsh had stayed, if Marsh had stayed, would they have gotten more wins? Maybe. But the manners of the defeats that, that Leeds were suffering, where they were just shipping goals, were terrible. Yes, they would score. Yes, they would have second halves where they would keep attacking and keep going and keep going, which made their goal difference and the underlying numbers look better than they were. But then even under under Allardyce, it still didn't work. And they were shipping goals, and then they were not scoring anymore. Uh, I'm sure Patrick Banford is going to lose lots and lots of sleep for missed shots, missed penalties that probably would have at least given uh, Leeds a shot to have a better chance on a final day. So Leeds, after 16 years in the wilderness, gets to spend three seasons in the Premier League. And then now their watch is over and they do have to go uh, down, down, down into uh, the championship where, you know, maybe they'll bring Bielsa back, but I believe he took the Chile job. So that is the relegation battle. Congrats to Everton. Congrats to Roger Bennett of the men in blazers whose staging of him yelling at te television screens is getting a little tired. Um, but, you know, they have taken a step forward <laughs> and the men in blazers brand it's a lot bigger than it was at doing a lot of social stuff so good for them um but we do have other games to go to and i'm going to just go right to the schedule and just go through them just in terms of what happened brentford the mighty bees of brentford do take it to manchester city uh they win one nil and do the double uh on a game that only had one xg total uh city played Cole Palmer, we had Rico Lewis in defense, you know, not quite our championship team uh, there. You know, Calvin Phillips played, I mean, good, a good, a good side, but not a connected side. Uh, Mares got some burn along with Sergio Gomez playing up front, which was a little bit odd. <laughs> so I, on the wing uh, in the Grealish spot. Um, a great season for Brentford. Pinnock with the goal, of course, on a set piece. How else would Brentford score? Uh, and they did really work at making lots of changes down the stretch to get this game done. Um, but they do the double against City and have a, a and have a really great 59 point haul where they sit in ninth. Um, Villa defeat Brighton to go to Europe. Uh, we saw the best of Brighton. We saw the best of Aston Villa and I do want to give a lot of a lot of time for Villa being they were proud to go to Europe unlike Spurs they are happy to be there Brighton are very happy to be there we've got two teams that want to be in Europe and have ambition and aren't jaded by the process of oh Thursday Sunday isn't that the fucking point and then the other thing that I think about with Aston Villa is how underrated this group is it's a play it's a team that's very solid the pieces all go together. 
and no one is talking about taking their players. Jacob Ramsey with another goal. Fantastic. Um, Ollie Watkins, why isn't he in the transfer requests? Why don't people want John McGinn? Why isn't he slated for Liverpool? What about Douglas Luiz? Doesn't he want to go to Liverpool? All these players that people are saying, oh, should go to other teams. Tyrone Mings, a left-footed fullback? Are you kidding me? Those are the best players ever. Uh, we keep talking about players leaving Brighton. You know, we talk about Estupian, uh, you know, Pascual Gross and all these players, McAllister, Buenanote and Undav and all these players that could move from Brighton. But how come no one's looking at players from Villa? They're only one game behind them, <laughs> you know, but we don't give Unai Emery the same thing because it's a more negative style. But they're right next to each other. You know, Aston Villa on 61 with Brighton on 62. But no one's talking about, you know, Aston Villa is the greatest team that was ever created. Unai Emery, respect, respect, respect Unai Emery. Guy fucking won with PSG, won four Europa Leagues. He's fucking legit. So uh, that's Aston Villa, West Brom. I mean, Brighton, uh, Brighton again, just loved the Deserby Bowl. Uh, we talked Leicester, West Ham. We talked Everton, Bournemouth, uh, Southampton four, Liverpool four. What? A 4-4. Liverpool really showing uh, they're not quite ready to be their normal self. The best part is the heartfelt Bobby Firmino goal. That was such a Bobby Firmino goal. Uh, Kalmadin Sulemana with two goals of outstanding quality to pull uh, this game nearly level. Oh, to actually pull the game level and actually um, go ahead 3-2 at halftime. But the powerful Liverpool attack pulls two goals back on 72 and 73 to win this game uh four four we saw everything that was the problem with Liverpool this season they can score they can go forward they've got nice stuff but they also can ship goals uh to be fair it is Matip and Joe Gomez at the back and it was Callagher and not Allison so but we did see our friend Mr. Trent Alexander-Arnold sort of get in trouble at the back but Liverpool do solidify their Europa League they will be on the Thursday the Thursday Sunday shift for the Premier League and then Arsenal with no pressure and nothing to play for just smoke Wolves 5-0 uh this is another heart strings getting pulled with Shaka granted Shaka scoring two goals in the first 15 minutes Saka Jesus and Kiwa are getting his first Premier League goal uh Arsenal setting the record for wins I think in a long time uh, most points they've had. Let's just see. Let's just give some context for, oh, sorry, for Arsenal season. I don't think they've gotten 84 points. Oh, God. It's got to be since they won the title in 2003. I'm going to check that, though. 84 points. When was the last time Arsenal had 84 points? Um, Yep. 2003 was the last time they had 84. They had 90 points. They hit 83 twice, 2007 and 2004, five, when they finished uh, third and second, respectively. But they have not had 84 points for 20 years. So this is a massive, massive season for Arsenal. And the 26 wins represents their most wins since they won the title. So right there with the Invincibles, uh, an amazing achievement for Arsenal and they can only go from strength to strength. But it's going to be tougher. They got to be ready because the Premier League does not stop. They will come after your ass again. So be ready uh, for that. Manchester United in their warm-up game uh, beat the mighty, powerful Fulham 2-1. Sancho getting warm as we get closer to the season, and Bruno Fernandes scoring the most hated man in the league, but God damn it. He's good and underrated. Kenny Tete gets a goal. Um, this game probably could have drawn, but uh, our friend, Mr. Mitrovic misses his fourth penalty kick of the season. I don't know how the hell you miss four penalty kicks in a year, but I guess if you score 40 goals in the championship and you get an eight game suspension for bumping a ref, you take the fucking penalties. So good for him. Chelsea season ends the way it started with a whimper 1-1 to Newcastle. I think Newcastle will be disappointed that they drew this game. A 14th draw for Newcastle. They're going to have to clean that up and find ways to win games next season if they want to challenge. They're solidified into the Champions League, finish the season in fourth behind United, uh, and we'll go through the table 
right after we finish the scores. And then a game that Nottingham Forest fans will be so happy didn't mean anything. The 1-1 draw with Nottingham Forest. Iwani from Gibbs White just showing one last time what got them up. If they can hold on to those two players, they'll stay in the league. It's not a very sim- it's a very simple game. Defend your goal and have guys who can score. It's not that hard. It's not that hard. You can stay up forever if you got a decent goal scorer, someone to get him the goal, the ball, and you don't give up goals. I know it sounds crazy, but <laughs> but that's the game, right? Right? Don't give them up and score them when you got them. Okay, so that is the final week of the season. Wowie wow! But let us uh, let's just go through the final table. Uh, I know you can just look it up, but I'll do some final commentary on each one. Um, City on 89, win the league, 61 goal difference, right in line with where they were, where you'd expect them. Arsenal, amazing season on 84. United, nine points behind that on 75. A good season for them. Uh, that Mourinho 81-point season when this in 17, eight, in 16-17 looks more and more like a genius season. Newcastle on 71, finishing fourth. Liverpool on 67, a 25-point drop from the season before. That just gives you a sense of how far they were on 93 last season or 90, 91 last season on 67 this season. That's how much they needed a midfielder, 30 points worth. Uh, Liverpool in fifth. Brighton on 62, five points behind them. Set the record, their highest place, they're locked on for Europa. Uh, in seventh, Aston Villa, Tottenham, and Brentford. Then we have, from Tottenham down, we have this run of mid-table London teams. Tottenham in eighth, Brentford in ninth, Fulham in tenth, Crystal Palace in eleventh. London holding up the middle of the table. Oh, along with Chelsea in twelfth. That's four, five London teams in a row. So London holding up the mid-table with uh, Chelsea in twelfth their worst finish ever in the Premier League. Wolves in 13th, representing the Midlands. West Ham, Bournemouth in 15th. Forest in 16th. Everton in 17th. Leicester, Leeds, and Southampton are down. Wow. That was the season. Another little anecdote. For the first time ever, the top half of the division, all on a positive goal difference. The bottom half of the division, all on minus. I look at that number. It sort of gives you an indicative of like, if you have a plus goal difference, you usually finish in the top half or you or and if you're not in line with where you should be, it usually is indicative of something to look at. So that's how I get my nerd fix. I kind of look at your goal difference and then I start trying to look under the hood and be like, hey, wait a minute. Why is Manchester United only have a 15 goal difference and then everyone around them is plus 35 and above? Hmm, United, maybe you got lucky. <laughs> So there's that there that I like to look at. And then I look at Brighton and they're plus 19. Not bad for them. Okay. Let us go to the superlatives of the season. Your top goal scoring players. Uh, the golden boot winner was the great and powerful Erling Holland on 36. Kane on 30. Tony on 20. Suspended. Won't be back till January. Mo Salah on 19. Callum Wilson, fire down the stretch on 18. Marcus Rasher on 17. Odegaard on 15. Martinelli on 15. Ollie Watkins, sneaky 15 goals with Saka on 14, making up your top 10 goal scorers. Just to give you a sense, to finish in the top five, you only needed 18 goals. Not, it's hard to score goals. Uh, the, your assist man, your passing boot, Kevin De Bruyne with 16. Salah with 12. So Salah with... 16 and 19, I mean, 19 and 12, a very, very, very good season uh, on the goal and sharing uh, side of things, along with Bakari Saka, who's going to have 14 and 11. Michael Luise, the smoothest motherfucker in the world for Crystal Palace on 11 assists with Riyad Mahrez, barely playing, barely playing, but still has 10 assists. So those are those guys. Um, Let us go to my best. 11 for the season. I'm going to do a 4-4-2. I'm going to make it fast. Okay, here we go. In goalkeeper, I have the great and powerful uh, Allison. He's too good. <laughs> uh, Allison is the best goalkeeper in the league. He saved fucking Liverpool so many goddamn times. It's just unreal. In defense, Kieran Trippier is the right back of the year. 
He was incredible. Sorry, Trent, you came on too late. You were not the best player consistently from week to week, and you did not hold up your end on the defensive side. Kieran Trippier in the top three of of shots created. What an incredible player. In central defense, I've got to have Ruben Diaz along uh, because he is the winning formula that gets City moving. It's without his leadership without his defensive steal, without everything that he brings to the team, City don't function. And his record shows that he was like 23-1 and when when he played. Once he came back into the side, that's when City took off. That's when John Stone stepped into midfield because they could trust that they had a central defender who could carry them forward. Uh, Then I have Sven Botman. The Newcastle defense is what made them work. So Botman's in there. Uh, he let Shar and Trippier do the things they needed to do because he controlled the rest of the defensive assignment. So between Diaz and Botman, I'm I'm rewarding defensive defenders. And then my left fullback, it has to be Estupinian. What a goddamn player. He is the best. Just screw you, Mr. Robinson. Uh, you're no longer the best defender. Estupinian for uh, Brighton. One guy's got to get in this team, and that's the man who's going to get it. Sorry, Caicedo, you're not going to make it into the midfield of this team because it's going to be across the four, on the wings, Grealish and Saka. Grealish just made City work. His pausing, his working back in defense just became City's best player in the second half of the season where he could just control games by attacking, slowing things down, moving things forward, getting the balls to Holland. And then Saka was the engine that made Arsenal work between he and Odegaard, there was almost 30 goals and at least 20 assists. Just an incredible group. Uh, but in the midfield, it's De Bruyne and Bruno Fernandez. Bruno Fernandez just makes United work. Once he got out of the shadow of Cristiano, he could do his thing again. He stopped deferring. He stopped being afraid of the legend. And he was able to be the Fernandez, the Bruno that he was when he first came to United and put them on his back. This guy's a 15 and 15 guy. I mean, he wasn't this season, but he can be. Uh, no one had more assists missed. Uh, his ex assist was over the room, over the over the moon, and he just missed out on so many little goals. He is a legend. If he would just stop rolling around on the ground, I could love him a little bit more. And then up front, it's Kane and Holland. Um, Holland, we've gone through a million times, but with With Kane, I do want to put another minute minute in. The guy scored 30 goals on that Tottenham team. That is a feat beyond recognition. He led the league in percentage of goals scored for his team. 30 goals on a team that only scored 70. That's 43% of their goals. No one's even close in the top 10 of goals. Um, Holland with 36 only represented 38% of the team's goals because City did score more and had more opportunities, but just an amazing amount of goals for a team that poor. Uh, I think it's the context. Like Spurs were brutal. And to score 30 goals on that Tottenham team that finished eighth, we're going to look back and go, how did he do that? Harry Kane then becomes only the second player ever to have two 30-goal seasons in the Premier League. You'd have thought it was Henri. It was not. He and Shearer now are the standalone as players who have 30 goals in a season. You know why that happens? Usually if you score 30, you leave and go to a better team where they don't need you that much. So uh, uh, Harry Kane, just an incredible, incredible, incredible player that uh, we all love and respect. We just want him to go play for United. Just do it. Just do it, Harry. Just go to United. Just be a pain in the ass. Say you're going to hold out and not play if you don't go. That's what you have to do. Be a dick. Really do it this time, though. Don't half-ass it. Be like, I'm not going on the tour. I'm not going on this. I'm not doing it. Hold out until you get your move. Okay. What else is there to talk about? Golden Gloves. We know De Gea won it, even though he was not the best keeper. Uh, he doesn't come for crosses, and he does save a lot of goals, but I, I think United would probably want a new goalkeeper and they should want a new goalkeeper um honorable mentions on teams of the season i just have to go back 
I do want to shout out Raya, who was fantastic in defense. Pinnock for Brighton was fantastic. Fabian Schar was fantastic. Uh, I love Tarkovsky. Lewis Dunk needs a shout in the midfield. Of course, Odegaard, of course, was fantastic. Caicedo was fantastic. Um, uh, Mo Salah not making this team is, is criminal. But there's only so many spots. We love them all. There's so many great players in the Premier League, and we're blessed to have them all in there. You know, um, just shout out to Bruno Gimares, who was also fantastic. Rodri, 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 you make City go to not have you in this team is ridiculous. Yes, it's all offensive midfielders, but, you know, that's just the nature of how football works. So that's my four. That was my 11, but those are my shouts. I do need to go on to, we talked about relegation. We talked about who is leaving the league, who is arriving. Luton Town win in a shootout. A good game, an enjoyable game. Luton Town just first half really, first half an hour really batter Coventry City with their force and energy and size. And they just seem to get to every second ball. They get the goal early from Jordan Clark, who bundles it in, uh, who fires it in on, on a cutback. Really good looking goal. Uh, but then Coventry grew into the game. They changed. They got their 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 talisman player, uh Gorkes up near um the player they needed it to be. Where's the guy's name? Oh, near Hamer, Gustavo Hamer, and who scored a goal on 66. So it was one one. We went to penalties, and sadly, on the sixth penalty, Fancati Dabo fires it over the bar. He did not look like he wanted to take a penalty, but every penalty was fantastic. Luton Town taking 10 years to go from the Conference League out of the EFL to the Premier League is a miracle. It is what Wrexham is trying to do. It would be if from the moment you come up in 10 years, if in 10 years Wrexham is in the Premier League, they will have matched what um, Luton Town did, along with Wimbledon and the the the, the, the oh whatever Wimbledon is the the crazy gang Wimbledon team in uh, Robbie Earl the, the mid eighties early nineties. So Wimbledon did the same thing. So Coventry City Valiant Sky Blue, we love them. We love the specials. We love Ska, but sadly Coventry, you have to go back and try and go again. Take the pain, lift it up and make yourself grow again. They've been on the up and up. I like where Coventry is. They just got to find more players and lift themselves up. Uh, thankfully, Tom Lockyer, who collapsed during the game, is fine. Uh, that was a scary moment. It was very reminiscent of your kind of... Um, it wasn't quite like Erickson, but he did just collapse without anyone touching him. He just hit the ground and just had, like, had a heart palpitation. So was it the COVID vaccine? Was it COVID? I don't know. Anyway, it doesn't matter. Luton, the Hatters, and their goofy fucking logo are in the Premier League, and we are happy to have them. Uh, you're going to hear about Kenilworth Low Road and the stadium. It's been done ad nauseum. Still, I'll say it one more time. Check out how you enter from the away end. You literally go through people's backyards. So that's a, a needed thing to say. But these are great. We're going to have great stories. Uh, I do want to go into uh, the League One playoffs as well, because there, there we have Sheffield Wednesday versus Barnsley. Wednesday, getting the goal late with in extra time of added time. So, uh, sorry, in extra time, in added time, in the, 20, the 120th minute, Sheffield gets the win and Barnsley in the South Yorkshire Derby. Sheffield Wednesday will be in the championship um, applying their trade. The championship is just going to be a fucking bloodbath next year with all the teams that are in there. And lastly, we have Carlisle going through on penalties versus Stockport. Stockport trying to do the double promotion, just a bridge too far, miss one penalty in the second round, and they have to go and stay in League 2 one more season, but Stockport were fantastic. Russ and the boys at Fan Hub, I'm sorry you had to go through that. It sucks, but um, Stockport County will will have another 
chance again. So that's your English pyramid. That is your conference pyramid. We know about Knotts County and Wrexham going up. Um, I didn't really discuss who went down in the championship, but remember, when someone's going up, someone's going down. So just keep that in mind when we think about pro rel for the USA and what it means and how great it is. It does mean someone's life is fucking ending and the moon door has grabbed them and sent them down to the nether regions of football. Just keep that in mind. As much as you cheer, feel the pain for others. Um, lastly, I don't normally do Bundesliga, but I do want to talk a little bit about Borussia Dortmund bottling <laughs> uh, against Bayern Munich. Bayern Munich were having their worst season ever uh, on 71 points. They were the worst points per game champion this season on 2.08 points per game. Um, they were only on 71. Yes, it's a 37, 34 game season. So I understand that part, but they were so, so bad. And Dortmund had a chance. All they had to do was win at home where they had only dropped points twice all season. They had um, dropped only four points all year at home. Mainz was on the beach. They give up two goals in the first 10 minutes. They fucking panicked. They bottled it. They choked. They had 80,000 fans in the Westfalen Stadium, and they yacked it. And so Bayern Munich and that broken fucking Bundesliga will have Bayern Munich win their 11th title in a row. You want to talk about a system that's not working? You keep telling me about this 50 plus one community-owned club shit. It shit doesn't work. You need competition. You need investment. You need people frayed. And in the Bundesliga, whatever that system is they have put together, it's not working for competition. You can't have Bayern winning your league every year and tell me it's a good league. Sorry, Bundesliga. Stop. Also, stop selling players to Bayern. Just everyone should collude and be like, no, we're not doing it. Done. So that's the Bundesliga. Um, most of the leagues are have their season ending next week. So Barcelona's already won. Napoli, we know, has already won. PSG won just now. City's already won. We've got it all squared away. We do have an FA Cup next week, a Manchester Derby. We do have Manchester City in the Champions League final while I'm in New York at Hooligan Day. So a massive, massive, massive weekend of football coming up. And then after that Champions League final, I will record my final episode for at least at least a few weeks. <laughs> I need a break. I need to recharge. I need to get myself back to neutral so I can enjoy this thing all over again. Anyway, thank you, everybody. It's been great. That was the Squeaky Bum Time podcast with Laurent Cortines. We are the football wing of the Chop Sports channel presented exclusively by the Premier Streaming Network. We record on Mondays and Thursdays, so be sure to subscribe wherever you get your show. And thank you so much. Please like, share, and subscribe to the show. It means everything. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you. Enjoy.